Okay, so I've already done a video covering the teams qualified in the men's saber, and I've done a video with Sergei Bida looking at the Epe. In this one, I'm going to go through all the teams that have qualified in the women's saber event. Most teams have been finalized by now, but some I'm not quite so sure of, so maybe there will be some mistakes. But anyway, here we go. On paper, France should be the favorites here. They have four very talented fencers who have been consistently winning medals for several seasons now. In the individual event, I would be surprised if one of them didn't win a medal. But despite their individual strength, it is surprising that they have struggled so much in the major finals. In 2018, they won the world title, but since then they have taken silver every year, including at the Olympics in Tokyo. That's what it means to the French team. Sarah Balzer was in great form last season, finishing the 2022-23 season ranked world number one in the world. This season somehow she has managed to become even more dominant, having medalled at every event so far this season. In fact, since March 2023, her worst result was a last date at the Worlds in Milan. Out of her last 11 competitions, Balzer has medalled at 10 of them which is just crazy. Manon Abitibrené was the French number one at the last Olympics, where she took bronze in the individual and silver in the team. Currently, she's ranked third. She has been at the top of the rankings for a while now. She is a super clean fencer, and she trains with her husband, Bolad Abiti, in Orléans. Cecilia Berder is one of my favourite fencers of all time. There's just a level of freedom to the way she fences that I really love. She was part of the team that won silver in Tokyo, after which she took some time off fencing to have a kid, but since then she's climbed her way back into the top 16. At the age of 34, she is one of the older women on the circuit now. Officer, I got one question for you. What are those? Nucha is a good example of why, in some ways, the Olympics is actually a weaker competition than the typical World Cup. As a sub, she won't get to fence in the individual event, despite the fact that she is ranked 18th in the world and recently won a silver medal in Seoul. She comes from Strasbourg, the same club as Belzer, and will be a strong asset in the team event. Hungary are kind of the opposite to France in that they haven't managed to pull off so many top results in individual events recently, but they have consistently performed well in the big team events, having won the last two world championships. They have a pretty young team, but they are fencers who have been competitive from a really young age, so inexperience shouldn't be so much of an issue. Pustai burst onto the scene at a very young age, winning a bronze medal at the European Championships in 2017 at 16 years of age. She finished her best season ranked 5th in 2019, but since then has kind of gradually declined, dropping out of the top 16. And at the most recent World Cup, she didn't even make the second day. Despite her decline in individual events, Pustai has still been stronger with the team, helping Hungary win many medals. As a junior, Batai was world number one in 2022, and that same year she was on the team that won the Senior World Championships, and once again in 2023. Her individual results have been kind of inconsistent. She has two World Cup medals, winning gold in Athens in 2023, and silver in Lima this year. But a lot of the time she does struggle to make it past the last 32. She's still young and very talented, I feel she still could be one of the dark horses for this event. Such is 21, the same age as Batai, which is pretty young for a two-time world champion. She hasn't had such good results in individual events, but she made a last date at the last World Cup, so again, a medal from her wouldn't be impossible. Anna Marton is currently the fifth highest Hungarian in the FI rankings, but I think she probably will be selected, maybe even as the third fencer. 
She won the overall FIE series title in 2017 and has stayed in the top 16 until the Tokyo Olympics. In 2020, she ruptured her ACL and appears to have had recurring issues with it. So long as she is physically in good enough shape, she could cause some big upsets relative to her current ranking. Korea are one of those teams that don't really have any individual superstars currently, but as a team they are really consistent in making the top four at World Cups. My one gripe with the Koreans is that they could do with a bit more variety in names. It makes it hard to keep track of which Choi, John or Kim is which. Yoon is the oldest on this team at 31. She was on the team that won bronze at the Tokyo Olympics and has a couple of World Cup bronze medals as well as two individual Asian titles. This will be her third Olympic appearance. The rest of the team is pretty young. Choi is 23 and showing decent signs of improvement, at least in her results. Last season she was battling somewhere around the last 64. This year she has been a regular in the 32 and won her first medal with a bronze in Tunis. John Hai Young is another left-hander. To be honest, I've not really watched a whole lot of the Korean women, but they all feel fairly uniform to me, all very clean and footwork based. Um, John's best results so far are a couple of last eights. The other John is right handed, she has also made a last eight this season. She tends to do smaller footwork than Hai Young. Uh, I'm not sure who exactly will be a third or fourth fencer but based on results it's going to be a tricky choice since they are kind of on a similar level. Ukraine surely have the most to fight for here. Despite the old cliche of keeping politics out of sport, these fencers have had their entire lives turned upside down by the Russian invasion. In 2023, I spoke to three different Ukrainian fencers about how their lives have been impacted, and to be honest, it's pretty bleak. As war rages on and Ukraine continues to seek support from Western countries, a good result from these athletes may play a role in raising the visibility of this issue and maybe could help with morale back home. Olga Karlan is one of the main contenders for the best women's sabre fencer of all time. Her World Cup record is just insane and she has won the individual world title four times. When she was 17 years old she carried the Ukrainian team to an Olympic gold at Beijing but hasn't won a gold at the Olympics since then. She last made the headlines in 2023 with the whole Smirnova handshake debacle, but since no Russians will be fencing at Paris, then that shouldn't be an issue here. Komaschuk has a handful of World Cup medals. She was also on the team that won silver in Rio. She has been very consistent in making the second day this season. Uh, she looks in a fencing quite similar to Olga Karlan in her guard position and the way she moves, they are both really good at using this kind of check on the long attacks to open up the distance in order to make space to accelerate into. Bakastova is the youngest on this team at 27 years old. According to her FIE profile, she was inspired to fence from watching the 2008 Olympics where Ukraine won gold. So it's a pretty cool story that she can now fence at the Olympics with one of those people that inspired her to begin with. Karatska is the fourth highest ranked Ukrainian currently, but based on experience, it wouldn't surprise me if she was put in the individual event as the third fencer. She was also on a team that won silver in 2016. I feel like since they've all been working, they've all been fencing together for a while, this could be a close knit group who work really well as a team. So this is a very fresh young team from the USA. This will be the first Olympics for all four fencers here. They have lost two experienced fencers in Mario Zagunis and Dagmara Wozniak, but what they lack in experience, they more than make up for in talent. I think this is the most exciting women's sabre team from the USA for a while now, and they're only going to get better looking ahead to their home Olympics in Los Angeles in 2028. If you follow this channel, then you will have seen a lot of Magda Skorbankiewicz. She has had something of a prodigious start to her career, winning multiple cadet and junior world titles, 
and making it into the top 16 of her senior rankings before she even turned 18. Some might call her fencing weird, I prefer the word authentic. She's not won many medals as a senior yet, but I promise that when she does, it will be spectacular. Tartakovsky is also ranked in the top 16. She is a distant relation of legendary coach uh, Yuri Gelman, who is also her personal coach. She has two World Cup bronzes so far and has had some pretty big wins in World Cups against the likes of Brune, Gudura and Marton. So you'll probably know that there has been a bit of controversy about Tatiana Naslimov. She's one of the fences that people have brought up a lot when discussing potential referee corruption. She is coached by Fikrat Valiev, an FIE referee who, in my opinion, I think is pretty dodgy. Uh, I've done a whole video about that. There was the notorious bout at an NAC where three bad calls all went her way, which resulted in two referees being sanctioned. Frankly, I'm getting a bit bored of talking about all this stuff, but regardless, she won't be out of place at the Olympics. She is still a really strong fencer. I think part of what makes it difficult is that she does some things that kind of go against the current meta that aren't necessarily bad decisions. They just put the referee in a bit of a tough spot in how to call these kind of actions, which this might partly explain why she tends to do better internationally than she does nationally. It's a shame that Maya Chamberlain won't get to fence in the individual event. I really like her fencing. She has some really strong parries and she takes different parries that you don't often see so much. I think the interesting thing with this team is how will they manage the all the tensions from, you know, the refereeing concerns and all that. When Maya Chamberlain won the American National Championships recently, she had part of her interview cut out where apparently she made reference to the ongoing issues. There is a lot of talent on this team, but clearly there's some potential for tensions to emerge. This will be a fourth successive Olympic qualification for the Italian women's sabre team. As a team, they reached their peak when they won the World Championships back in 2017 and finished the season at the top of the world rankings. Since then, they have stayed towards the top end of the rankings, but have struggled to win much gold. I think it's also worth talking about at some point the absence of the Russians because if they were still fencing, it's pretty likely that Italy wouldn't have qualified, which just shows how high the global standard is now and how difficult it is becoming to qualify for the Olympics. This will be a second Olympic Games for Krishio. In Tokyo, she lost in the last 32 in the individual event and then lost in the bronze medal match in the team. She's a bit of a hot and cold fencer, either losing in, in the first round or making a top 8, with not a whole lot in between. Of the two times she has made a major final, she has won them both, so I think if things start well, she could have a shot at a medal. Oh, Chiara Mormile is left-handed. Like a lot of Italian women, she can be pretty aggressive off the line. She's had a few World Cup bronzes in the last few years, and is the second highest Italian in the FI rankings making her a pretty clear choice for the selection. This is where the selection gets a bit more interesting. Um, Rosella Gregorio is the third highest Italian in the international rankings, but instead it is Michela Battiston who is selected. This will also be a second Olympics for Battiston, although in Tokyo she was the substitute, so didn't get to fence in the individual event. She has won a World Cup silver medal, but Gregorio has a much stronger medal record overall so it is an interesting choice. To make things stranger Gregorio isn't even selected as a sub instead it will be Irena Vecchi. It's an interesting choice although she's getting on age-wise Vecchi is still a solid fencer. I just wonder what criteria the selectors were using here exactly. Since Yuki Ota's silver medal in 2008 Japan have been getting stronger and stronger across all weapons. Despite boasting two-time world champion Emura Misaki, Japan haven't won a whole lot of silverware in team events recently. Nonetheless, they have still clearly overtaken China, who for a long time were the dominant force in Asia. Emura is going in as one of the favourites in the individual event, I think. She has won the world championships now twice in a row and is currently second in the world rankings, a position that she has held for pretty much three seasons straight. 
She is incredibly technical, amazingly versatile, using a wide variety of different preparations and is quite simply a joy to watch. Takashima is one of those fencers who has become very regular in making the last 64, but she rarely progresses much further, apart from one silver medal in 2022. I think it is worth saying at some point that making the last 64, you know, the second day at a World Cup is getting really, really hard. And in some ways, winning a medal at a World Cup is harder than at the Olympics, since there are so many more fencers to beat. Fukushima was on a team that finished fifth in Tokyo. Like a lot of the Japanese women, she has very tidy footwork. Uh, one thing I like about the Japanese is that they seem very clear in their intentions. I feel like they are kind of easier to referee in a way because it's generally quite obvious what they are trying to do. The Japanese substitute will be Ozaki Seri. She is 21 years old, the youngest on the team. I think this is a good example of the importance of investing in a structure with everyone training together with a national coach. Ozaki was never really a top junior, but she has gone on to become a really solid senior. And this kind of thing doesn't really happen in countries that, that don't have those kind of structures. And it's a good indicator of how Japan is progressing. Algeria are by far and away the underdogs here. There's not a whole lot of competition in Africa for women's sabre right now. At the recent African Championships, there were only three teams present, with Algeria, I believe, not attending due to political tensions with the host country, Morocco. Boudia fenced for France up until 2022. She won a fair few medals with the team and made a few last dates as an individual. She nearly quit fencing after Tokyo, but was convinced to come back and fence for Algeria. If this team is going to make it through the first round, Boudiaf is going to have to be firing on all cylinders. Kelly also trains in France. She is with the Boer Academy. She has made a last 64 out of the last three World Cups, so she's in decent form. She also had a strong performance at the World Championships in the team event, where against China she came on in the final relay, behind by 10 points, and managed to win the match. So she definitely could cause some trouble here. I don't think Belkebir has even made a last 64, but she did manage to qualify for Tokyo, so this will be her second Olympics. Last time she lost 15-1 in the first round, but maybe this time going in with a full team with her could give her some of that extra confidence. It is a lot harder going to an Olympics when you're the only fencer from your country. I don't really know a whole lot about Bungab. I don't think she's ever made a last 64 at a World Cup. The thing is in Sabre is having one fencer on the team who is considerably weaker than the rest can make it really challenging for the team. In Epe and maybe to a, a lesser extent in Foil, a weaker fencer may be able to play for time and just do their best to avoid being hit and maybe even get passivity. But in Sabre you have to fence for every touch. So that's all the teams. Uh, it's likely that I've got some stuff wrong or maybe that some things will change. So please leave a comment if you've got any useful information. I'll try to do some more videos covering the fencers who qualified as individuals too. Uh, as I said, I've done an epic preview, uh, but I probably won't have time to do a foil one. Uh, these videos take loads of time to make. If you want to support the channel, I'd really appreciate if you join the Patreon. You'll get early access to some videos and there's a growing catalogue of exclusive videos that you won't find on YouTube. I recently did an analysis video uh, starring Adam Moataz, just breaking down some of the touches he scored at the Seoul Grand Prix. So yeah, if you want to watch that, join a Patreon. Cheers guys, see ya.